All right, we're really excited to have Karen here today. Uh, she is an internationally acclaimed business consultant, coach, and lean protect practitioner, and co-author of the Toyota Way to Service Excellence. Karen comes to the world of business and lean from the world of art. A practicing artist um, <clears throat> with an MFA in sculpture, Karen helps people rediscover their creativity so they can generate new ideas based on synthesized learning from previous experiences. Please welcome Karen. Thank you. Thank you. I think that I found out that a better way to start my day is clapping versus coffee. That got everybody going, right? <laughs> yes. All right, so first of all, thank you for coming here. I'm thrilled to be here. It's wonderful to meet you all. I'm going to start with a quiz. OK, here's the quiz. Does anybody know why my fingernails are these colors today? If you look at your street signs here in Grand Rapids, you'll notice that each of them has the flag of the city of Grand Rapids colors on them. Nice. Blue, red, and yellow, right? Aha, uh -huh. details. This is how I chose. And one of the things that we're going to talk about today is service excellence and service excellence, which is effective, efficient, and personal. Service excellence is in the details. How do we think about the people that we're serving? So I'm thinking, I'm coming here to Grand Rapids. I have the wonderful opportunity to meet you all and to spend the day with you all. I'm thinking about you first. What can I do? to make a personal human connection with you down to the smallest details. Oftentimes, when we think about lean, we think about efficiency or effectiveness. We don't always think about personal human connection. So today, we're going to talk about service excellence is effective, efficient, and personal. So you heard a little bit about me. You can read more about me. I have a question for you. How many of you here work in? city or state government? Raise your hand. Excellent. How many of you work in a manufacturing environment? Excellent. How many of you work in a service environment? Excellent. How many of you live here in the Grand Rapids area? Uh -huh. How many of you have services from the city or the state of Grand Rapids? How many of you shop at local businesses or businesses in this area? Ah, then all of you are customers, right? All of your friends who live in this area are customers. All of your family members who live in this area are customers. Is that so? Excellent. I'd like you to think about that. Yesterday, where's Alan? I had the wonderful opportunity to go with Alan and see the work that he's doing in the water systems warehouse. And you know what I was really impressed by? Well, there were a million things. But the thing that I was really impressed by was that every time Alan told me about a Kaizen that they'd done, the first person that he talked about was the customer, right? Maybe things might be a little harder for us to do. Maybe things might involve a little more work for us to do. But if they made an improvement for the customer, that's who we need to think of first. Because guess what? Every single one of you who lives here, every single one of you, no matter what job you work in, what kind of organization you work in, have only one purpose. Your organization is here to serve the customer. So let's talk a little bit more about service excellence. I'm going to tell you a true story or two stories. Aha. Uh -huh. Let's talk service excellence. So I have um, oftentimes need to make hotel reservations. And so I had a problem with one of the reservations. I needed to change something. And it's a very big hotel chain. And I called to see if somebody could help me. And of course, when I answered, the, the, did a person answer the phone? No, I got the machine, and the machine said, hello, you reached this and this service line. Unfortunately, although we do not recognize your number, so please, before we go any further, can you enter your rewards number? 
I'm like the highest tier of rewards because I travel all the time. So I have to look on my app, I enter the number, then they say, okay, do you want this, 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 or this? And I have to enter the number. And then I have to wait online because eventually someone had to help me. And you know what the person said when I, fi I finally got to a person? Do you know what the person said? <laughs> What's your number? I said, I have been a member of this organization, of this hotel chain, of this rewards program for five years. Why don't you know my number? You already, always knew my number. They said, we've had a system integration. And we've merged everything, and now we've lost everybody's number. And I was like, really? I was like, could you put my number back into the system? And do you know what they said? You'll have to go on our website to do that. And then I asked them for help to fix my reservation. And the first person couldn't do it. And they said, let me transfer you to another person. Eventually, my reservation got changed. Do you know how long it took? An hour and a half. Yes, I know. Isn't that shocking? I have fabulous customers that I help all over the world. What happened to those customers while I was on the line trying to figure out my hotel reservation? They were waiting. I, as the customer, guess what? My time was wasted, wasn't it? What happened to the people that I need to help? That's story number one. Story number two. Here's how it goes. I got a kitten. I know, isn't everybody excited? You don't often get to hear a keynote speaker come on stage and say, I got a kitten. He's three months old now, but I actually got him when he was three weeks old, and he was abandoned in one of my neighbor's sheds. So I took the kitten. Of course, I took the kitten to the vet, and the vet told me all kinds of things, including that because he was so little and he didn't have his mother, he needed to have kitten lysine supplement. I was like, whoa, I do not know anything about kitten lysine supplement. I know a lot about service excellence. I know a lot about lean. I know absolutely nothing about kitten lysine supplement. I have a dog. His name is Karma. And we buy his food from Chewy.com. So again, Here's a service in which my number is in the system. So I go on the Chewy website. Would you like to guess how many different kinds of kitten lysine there are on Chewy website? <laughs> like 12 different kinds, who knew? So I'm looking on the website, I'm looking on the website, I'm like, well, I would have no idea what kind of kitten lysine is the best kind of kitten lysine for my kitten. So I called the number right up on the screen. And do you know what happened? On the first ring, a live person answered the phone. And do you know what they said? They said, hi, Karen. How can we help you today? And I'm like, I know, you're shocked, right? This is like unbelievable. I said, OK, can you tell me about the kitten lysine? And then the person told me all about the kitten lysine, and I ordered the one I wanted. Then I had another idea. Since I take my big dog, Karma, for a walk all the time, and he really loves the kitten, he's been asking for a kitten for about a year, so he's like really happy he finally got a kitten. I thought, well, Karma really doesn't want to go for the walk without Cosmo the kitten, so what if I get a stroller? I know, a cat stroller, and I pet stroller, and I can walk, put Cosmo in the stroller, and I can walk Karma, so I go back on Chewy. How many kinds of cat strollers do you think there are? A lot. So I call. I know also because I want to test, is somebody going to answer the phone live on the first ring? So guess what happens? Person answers the phone, hi, Karen, how are you doing? I say, I'm doing totally fabulous. This is the second time in two weeks I have called Chewy at both times. A live person has answered the phone using my name. And they said, yes. That is because seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, a live person answers this telephone using the customer's name if they have an account and they're on file. Do 
you think I'm going to order from Chewy again? Yes, oh, there's many. Kitten's only three months old. I'm sure I can find many, many more things <laughs> over his lifetime. So those of you who think story number one is an example of service excellence. Story number one, one and a half hours trying to change my hotel reservation. If you think that's service excellence, raise your hand. I didn't either. Story number two, kitten lysine, kitten stroller, personal human connection. If you think that's service excellence, raise your hand. Wonderful. So here's the thing. We are all customers. We all experience these things. What I would like you to do now is turn to your neighbor who you are sitting with, or you can turn behind you or work with a group of three. I'd like you to take three minutes and tell one another a story. And you can choose on your own. You can choose a story of not so service excellence, as I call it. Or you can choose a story of service excellence. Turn to your neighbor. Tell them your story. Go. <laughs> about service excellence, it's hard to stop, isn't it? 
I know. That's the problem. Or the blessing. So, quick question. Show of hands. How many of you told a fabulous story of unbelievable service excellence? If you told that, raise your hand. Oh, that's more than normal. <laughs> How many of you told a story of not so service excellence? Aha. Uh -huh. Look around. I want to point that out to you because no matter what kind of industry you work in, manufacturing, service, government, people are talking about service. And unfortunately, the stories that they're often talking about are the not so service excellence ones. I don't tell the name of companies that I had a not so service excellence experience about. I only state the name, I told you Chewy, right? The service excellence. But guess what? Most people <coughs> will tell you what company they had that not so service excellence experience with. If you're a company, that's really bad because a lot of times people put those experiences on social media. I know Facebook, Twitter, news travels fast, doesn't it? Service is really important. So I'd really like us to think about that. And we talked about service excellence. I'm going to tell you what today's customers from all of my travels around the world, working with all kinds of different clients here in North America, in Canada, all around the world, I've actually find that there are some similarities of what today's customers really want. And unless we actually give each one of our fabulous human being, family member, customers, exactly what they want. When they want it, do you know what's going to happen? When they tell their stories to their friends, they may not be telling the story of service excellence about us. So here's what I found that today's customers really want. And as you go about your work in your organization and as you go about your daily life as customers of all kinds of processes, I'd like you to think how this applies to you as well. First of all, when we talk about lean, giving customers what they want when they want it, right the first time, hassle-free, that's actually just the basic entry level now. Right? It doesn't matter what organization or what kind of organization you work for. Guess what? We've all had the experience of Amazon One Click, right? Oh, I know. I had to have it disabled because too many process improvement books came to my house. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly what they want, right? Organizations, when your customers call you, they're not comparing your service to other organizations that are similar to yours. They're, they're comparing the experience they have with your organization with the experiences that they have as a customer that are service excellence experience. Press a button. You don't need to do anything else. Your item comes to you. Press a button. In two minutes, you can see Uber coming to you, right? what they want, when they want it, right the first time, no hassle, entry level, absolutely entry level. But for today's customers, that's not enough. The second thing all of today's customers are looking for is something that I call luxury experience at coach prices. So I'm going to tell you a story. My parents, they're 85, and they live in Canada. And they're very nice, 85-year-olds, and they flew home from visiting Florida, because you know it's a little cold for them now. And they had to take a taxi from the airport to their house instead of an Uber. And guess what? When they don't have an experience that they think is service excellence, what do they do? They call me, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. We're talking about it, but we're going to talk about it to me. So they call me. What are they unhappy about? Their experience? In the taxi, there was no place for them to plug in their iPad <laughs> to charge it. 
I know you're laughing, you're thinking, but I'm telling you, this is not millennials. This is everybody. There's no place to plug in their device to charge it. And the taxi driver did not give them a bottle of water <laughs> or a snack, nor did the taxi driver engage them in friendly and polite conversation. All he did was drive. I know, can you believe it? This was bothersome to 85-year-olds. And do you know what was the worst thing of all about it? They had to pay twice as much as Uber, right? Think about it, this is the reality TV world. What it's made is each of us a VIP, as we should be. Every single person is a very important person. And we all expect to have a luxury service, but is any of you willing to pay more for it? Absolutely not. And if you want another example, think about going to any fast food restaurant. When I was growing up and you went into McDonald's, it was plastic tables and plastic chairs and it didn't look very fancy. Now you go to McDonald's and it's McCafe, right? Luxury service at coach prices. So service excellence, first, has to be exactly what the customer wants when they want it right the first time. It has to have that luxury feel, but be less expensive. And the last, I believe, is the most important. And that is personal human connection. Because although many people believe that technology is going to be the differentiator of the future, guess what? I don't believe that. I believe that service is going to be the differentiator of the future. Personal human connection. Every single technology can be copied, right? I've gone to visit Toyota. In a Toyota plant, you know what? They buy all kinds of cars from other plants, from other brands, and they take them apart, right? And they look at all of the technology. The wonderful thing about human beings, this is the really, really wonderful thing about human beings. Human beings cannot be copied. Our creativity, our ingenuity, our inventiveness cannot be copied. And every single person, no matter how many friends you have on Facebook, no matter how many likes you get on LinkedIn, on social media, do you know what we really want? Personal human connection. When I called Chewy on the phone, the fact that someone answered with my first name, they knew me. Out of the billions of people who called, they knew me. As human beings, that's what we really want. So when you go back to your organization and you think about how you serve your customers, and we put our live human being, very important people, customers first, I'd like you to think about your processes. Do they have all three of these? Because in today's world, this is what all customers want. Why is that important? Well, did you know that more than 50% of customers leave a service provider due to actually one poor service experience? In 2013, Accenture did a study, and they found that 51% of customers, if they had one poor service experience, left the provider that they were with and switched to another. So, show of hands, how many of you have had a poor service experience somewhere and actually left that service provider, whether it be a restaurant, whether it be your insurance company or bank, and gone somewhere else. Oh my goodness, <laughs> almost everyone, right? Me too, the internet makes it unbelievably easy to find someone who has a similar product, a similar uh, price and process. How many of you actually, before you left the service company that you were with, because you had one bad service experience, how many of you actually told the provider why you were leaving? Aha, uh -huh. that's it. Most of us just switch. So organizations often hire me, and I ask them, how's your customer service doing? How's service excellence? They say, oh my goodness, we have fabulous customer service reviews. We don't have a customer service satisfaction problem. I say, okay, great. 
how's your retention doing? How's your customer retention doing? They say, oh my goodness, the customer retention is terrible. That's why we hired you. I said, oh, then you have a customer service problem because the happy customers are sending you a review. The unhappy customers are doing what? Leaving. I call it voting with their feet. They're absolutely leaving. And unfortunately, in this economy, this is really a problem. Is it easier to keep a customer, or is it easier to find a new customer? Keep a customer. So if you're a business that wants to grow, I'm going to give you the secret. The secret is that you have to find all of the customers that were unhappy with their one poor service experience elsewhere, attract them to your company, and make sure you have all of those three peak service experience, service excellence policies, and then they will never leave you. That's the easiest way to grow. And in 2013, in the United States economy, $1.3 trillion changed hands because of switching. So now all of you who work in the private sector say, oh, that's all well and good for us. And all of you who work for city and state government say, well, what about us? And I said, you who work in government have a more I know, bigger responsibility, because guess what? Your fabulous citizens who are your customers, can they leave? Can they switch? No, do we want them to? Would we like them to move to lovely Naperville, Illinois, instead of live here in Grand Rapids? No. So the thing is, we have to be even more cognizant, because those people do not have the ability to switch. They are stuck with whatever it is that we provide them. They don't have a choice. Do you think those customers aren't talking because they don't have a choice? I assure you they are talking, right? And not only that, all of those customers, if you're a local business, if you work in government, that customer could be your 85-year-old mother, right? Could be your friend's cousin. Those people are our family. That's that personal human connection. So we really need to think about that in the service we create, especially if customers can't switch, we have even more of an obligation to create those peak services for every single one of them. So let's talk for a moment about, well, when we create these services, what do we have to think about that's specific to services different from manufacturing? Well, in service, we have a number of things that we are responsible. First is the service product, and second is the service process and experience. So I work with many organizations, like insurance companies or banks, or variety of things. And I, when I talk to them, I say, OK, well, what product are you making for your customers? They say, product, what are you talking about? We're a service company. We don't make a product. We make service. I know. It's crazy, isn't it? We don't see that. And I say, well. I have insurance for my house, and I believe that once a year when my policy gets renewed, somebody actually sends me either an email or a paper policy. That policy, that's a product, isn't it? We have to make sure that that product or the claim check or the deposit into someone's bank account is exactly what they want when they want it and done right the first time. Has anybody not had? A bank deposit, make it correctly into your account. I know it's not, it takes a lot of time and it's very worrisome, isn't it? Did it make you a happy customer? No. Maybe you switched banks? Yes. So the service product has to be right, but the service process and experience has to be right too. So actually, in services, we have a bigger responsibility for creating those peak service elements. We have to worry about the product and the process and experience as well. Anybody ever eat in a restaurant and you had absolutely the most delicious food that you ever had and terrible service? Right? Wait, wait staff ignored you. Maybe you had to wait a very long time for your bill. Did you go back to that restaurant? No, right? 
we need to consider both of those things. So that's one of the differences about services. The other difference is that service is about people. In Lean, when we talk about creating value, we talk about how we put exactly what the customer wants into their product. In services, in manufacturing, you might see a product going down a line, like a car, right? In services, in general, that value is created in the moment of interaction between two fabulous human beings, the customer and the service rep, right? Think about it. If you call your health insurance provider's call center because you need an answer to a question, the value, the answer to the question is created in the moment that you are actually on the phone with your customer. So, let me tell you something about people. Service representatives and customers. Maybe you've noticed it already, but maybe not. People are not perfect. Has anybody noticed that? <laughs> I know. They are not perfect. The people who are your customers. Do they always give you the right information? I started out in the lean world. I started out because I was working at a payroll company and I took care of 300 customers' payrolls. I would listen, they would call me, I would manually enter the payroll information into an old DOS computer system, that blue screen. Do you remember it? Blue screen? Yep. F6, F7, you did that, right? Yes. yes. So, do you think I heard, do you think that the customer always told me exactly the correct payroll number for each employee? No, because people are not perfect. Maybe I got distracted for a second. Maybe I didn't hear properly, because at that point, I will tell you, cell technology is not what it is today. It was still those pretty big phones, right? Did I sometimes make a mistake entering the payroll? Of course, people are not perfect. So we need to take that into account when we are creating the services and the processes that we use to deliver that service to them. How do we make sure our customers are able to give us the most correct and accurate information that we need? Because the information that they give us in general is going to be the input that creates the outcome of what their service is. How do we make sure that we, who are the service providers, have everything that we need to make sure that we can get that information correct and it gets correctly in, put into whatever system that we're using to do it. So that's the two biggest differences I would say in that we have to think about in services. So all of this is all great information, all well and good. What are we supposed to do with it? If we're now tasked with creating those three elements of peak services, how do we do it? I'm going to give you the answer. That's why you're all here and it's really simple. There's two things we need to do. One is that we need to help people get ideas for new and better ways to do things. Ways to get information right the first time up for front from clients. Ways to create our systems so they don't allow us, fabulous human beings, who are not perfect to make errors when we create the service process and products. So we need some creativity. And then, once we help people reclaim their creativity and get ideas, we can use our Toyota way to service excellence, lean principles, practices, and tools to turn those ideas into fabulous service. Because guess what? If we have an idea in our head and we don't actually turn it into a reality, does it help our customer? No. Does it help us? Does it help our organization, our community, the world? No. So we need both of those. So we're going to start first with creativity. So let's talk about creativity. All of you in this room who think you are very creative, raise your hand. Yay! OK. What about the rest of you? This lovely, brave young lady has raised her hand. What about the rest of you? I know. This happens all of the time. This is what happens the most. I ask people, are you creative? And you know what they do? 
I know they look at their feet. They turn, turn around, they think, oh, this is the right time. Just, I just have to check that really important text message that came on my phone, right? I know, this is the problem. I believe the problem exists that we do not, as adults, think we're fabulously creative people because we have an incorrect definition of creativity. So the definition, and you can think about it if this is your definition, creativity is flashes of inspiration, bolts of lightning that come down from the sky, I know, and hit someone else, not me, right? I work as an engineer. I work as a police officer. I work in the payroll department. I'm not creative. How many of you here have children? How many of you here were children? Aha! <laughs> uh -huh. So, children are very creative. Think back to your own experience, if you have children, of their small, when they were small, or your own experience of being a small child. I'm sure you had many creative ideas of ways to do things in all sorts of different ways, maybe some of them that the management didn't actually really appreciate, right? <laughs> so if we all come creative, because I believe creativity is an innate part of who we are as people, what happens? What happens? Well, a couple of things happen. First of all, we actually grow up and our brains become less plastic. Instead of wanting novelty and looking for new things, when we're around 19 or 20, our brains actually start looking for similarity. We want to be friends with people who have similar ideas to us, right? We start, our brains change. And then also, we go to school. And when we go to school, guess what? We learn to look for the one right answer. We bubble all those tests so we can get a good mark on our SAT and ACT and go to a good college. We sit in our seat at work oftentimes and people tell us what to do. So between our brain and our experience, most of us tend to believe that we are not creative. However, the world is changing. Organizations are changing. Customer needs are changing. In order for our organizations to meet those needs, we're gonna have to have everybody understand that they are creative. So if you take away one thing from this talk, I would like you to use the Karen Ross definition of creativity. And that is creativity is simply the ability to make something new, to put ideas together in new and different ways from experiences we've previously had. All right, anybody here have a smartphone? Anyone have a smartphone? Yeah? I can't live without mine. So I think this is a great example. We tend to think of this as new, but guess what? Telephone technology has been around since the 1880s, Alexander Graham Bell, right? Photography technology even earlier. I have 16,000 photos on this phone. I never took a picture before I got a phone. <laughs> and in 1982, I'll date myself, but you can already see me. I was working at my first job, and I took my first personal computer out of a box. I know I was sent to, turn, I was sent to a week of training to learn how to turn it on and use WordPerfect. We think of this as something new and creative. However, guess what? I would say this is simply three old technologies put together in a very different way. Was it put together by artists? No. It was put together by regular human beings, all different kinds, working in all parts of different organizations who used their creativity to make something that now we cannot all live without. So let's try it again. How many people here? are very creative, much better. Thank you. All right, so once we help people get ideas and they got great new ideas, we have to help them turn them into reality. And that's where our Toyota Way to Service Excellence principles, practices, and tools comes along. And here you can see our four Ps, philosophy, process, people, and problem solving, and our 17 principles. 
I'm going to talk about three of them today, and that is passionately pursue purpose based on guiding values. That's number one. Number two, deeply understand customer needs. And number three, flow value to customers. Because flowing value, remember we talked about creating value. Flowing value is the basis of all lean work. And oftentimes in services, we forget that. We get very interested in tools. We very, get very interested in techniques. And we forget we need to actually flow value to our very human being customers. So I'm going to tell you a little story. These are my friends from Hennig. And when I first met Hennig, and they're a company out of Rockford, Illinois. And they're a third generation company, and they're really interested not only in making a better company, but because Rockford is a somewhat depressed community, they're one of the biggest employers in Rockford, and their goal is to grow so that they can employ more people from Rockford so they can give back to their community and make a stronger community through manufacturing. So when I first met them, you know what their mission statement and their purpose was? Be the best machine chip and machine cover protection company in the world. Something like that. I know there's a lot of mission statements out there like that, isn't there? Through a little bit of work we did, we realized that they had to really take a look and see, well, what is actually that we're trying to accomplish here? What are we passionately pursuing? What's our purpose? And they spent some time, and they worked with their executive team and the CEO, and they changed to a different mission and vision. And that is simply making our customers successful. Because they realized that even though they're a manufacturing organization, and they use Toyota Way and Lean in their manufacturing and their services, that they simply existed for one reason only as a company. And that was to make their customers successful. Once they changed that, once they changed their thinking to understand their purpose, they realized, do we actually really know what each of our customers wants. And you know what they realized? They didn't. They were so focused internally, they didn't know what their customers wanted now or for the future. So they hired Addie. You see Addie? She was probably on the job about three weeks here. And Addie became the customer success specialist. And the first thing that Addie did was she actually called personal human connection, went to visit customers. Stood in the lobby when customers came in and talked to them. And you know what she found that they really wanted? It was really simple. When somebody called, they wanted a live human being to answer the phone. They're a family business. They want, their customers wanted to feel like family. So guess what? Using Toyota Kata, they created a challenge to strive for one piece flow. Think about it. 90% of calls answered on the first ring by a live person and actually by the person who the caller was calling for. That's flow. Start, no waiting. Get exactly what you need, right? So they did a variety of very different creative things. And it took them about two months. Some of the things they did was they gave people cell phones. Company paid for cell phones. So when they walked around, they had their, their phone forwarded to their phone. They paid people, actually, to do that. The biggest thing they did was have the receptionist, instead of the machine answer the phone, the technology, they had the receptionist answer the phone. The receptionist was thrilled because you know what she said? It's really boring for me to sit here and do this paperwork. What I really like to do is talk to customers. That's what you hired me for. It took them two or three months. They actually got to 94% of calls. And they're still working on it. So if Henning can do it, everyone can do it. Oftentimes when people end a speech, they leave other people with some conclusions. I'm not going to leave you with conclusions. I'm going to leave you with some questions that I'm going to ask you to take back 
to all of your organizations, to the teams that you work with. Because in asking those questions and then starting to work on some of these things, you're going to make things better for your customers and for your organization. So first of all, how can we make our customers successful? How can we do that? How can we create systems that are going to make our team members successful? Bless you. <laughs> you're welcome. So that they can help others. How can we do that? Because really, we're here to help people. Service is about putting the needs of others before our own. How can we help people be creative, reclaim their creativity? How can you work with your teams to create the ways to give your customers what they want, when they want it, at the lowest possible price with personal human connection? Lean is actually about creativity. It's not about copying. It's not just about using tools. Sakichi Toyoda is known as the king of inventors in Japan. How do we harness the creativity that every single one of us has inside to create what our specific, very human being customers need? And last, what does flow look like in your work? Oftentimes, I go to service organizations. They can give me the most fabulous definition. They must have read the lean lexicon. I'm really. They can give you word for word what flow is. And then I say, OK, great. Let's go to the service Gemba floor. Let's go to your call center. Let's go to the place people are underwriting. I say, OK, show me what flow would look like here. They can't do it. So I'd like you to think back to Hennig. A customer calls. They reach the person they need they can give them the answer. In service, that's what flow looks like. So please take these questions back to your organization. It's important for your customers. It's important for your team members. And I'm going to say that there's a wider importance. It's important for the world. As adults, we spend more of our time at work than we spend anywhere else. What we teach people at work to be creative, to solve problems, to think of ways to serve others, they take those home to their family. I've been married 35 years. I can guarantee you things have not been all perfect in the 35 years. But they take those ways of thinking and solving problems home to their family. They take them to their community. They take them to their cities, their states, their country, the world. There are a lot of problems in our world. Homelessness, hunger, poverty. There's 7 billion people here on this earth. The only people here to solve these problems are us. When we teach people at work ways to work, lean ways, we actually change the world. You can see I wear a little button here. It's a little heart button. That's for love and kindness. Everywhere I go that I meet people who are being kind, sometimes not so kind. I hand them a button and a little slip of paper. I brought one for each of you. They're out on the table if you would like one. And then also my little PDCA button, because when we really understand PDCA and we keep solving problems and we keep working on things, when we put others' needs in front of our own and work to serve others, we will reach our true north and fulfill our purpose. So. Thank you all for your service. Thank you all for your commitment to learning. Thank you all for being here. It is an honor to meet each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Feeling very inspired. Um, just so you know, on the next break, we are going to have the opportunity to have a book signing up front. Um, so we do have copies of, um, of the book that Karen co-authored, and she will be available to sign those. So um, first, I would like to introduce to you our Deputy City Manager, Eric DeLong. Uh, Mr. DeLong has been with the City of Grand Rapids since May of 1990, uh, 1995, first as the Assistant City Manager for Public Works, um, and then as a Deputy City Manager since 99. Uh, Mr. 
Long coordinates policy and direction for approximately 420 employees, um, oversees $110 million of design development and enterprise system groups, and directs state and federal legislative activities for the city along with his leadership roles in lean thinking. And many of us here at the city give credit to Mr. DeLong as being really the driving force that has gotten us to the point that we are today um, in our lean journey. So please help me welcome Mr. DeLong. I see a phone here. That's mine. Oh. I know, and I can't live without it. <laughs> hey, Rob. Hey, everybody. Thanks uh, for being here today, and uh, welcome to Grand Rapids. So you'll have a great day of learning. Uh, this is a great conference. We're in our third year now, right? And uh, there are 112 of you here. So we started uh, with 40 in the first year. We got to, I think, 60 in the second year. And here we are at 112 now. So um, we didn't get here uh, by accident. So a lot of people help with that. And I'd like to thank Steve and Alan and uh, the MLC team and also our city team for helping put this together here in our, in our city. So um, you might want to know, you know, how does the city get started? How does the government unit get started in this? And it started uh, more than a decade ago with a uh, mayor, George Hartwell. And uh, what? Okay. So anyway, I'll, I'll keep going with my story then. Uh, so it started with the mayor, George Hartwell. And uh, he said, hey, have you heard about this lean thing? And can you do Six Sigma? And it's like, whoa, you know, that, what is that? And so... Uh, I talked to some people and ran into uh, people who were doing this at Steelcase and uh, gave me some really good advice. We found a great consultant and were able to begin to understand lean thinking. And uh, we started out very slowly. We uh, worked with uh, employee groups. We did the full three-day value streams, had orientation for top management and persons who were going to be in the team. And then we started down the road of doing, of doing that work. And uh, we found out uh, pretty soon that the three-day value streams was a, a significant um, time commitment uh, that uh, we, we learned early on that even with the consultant's help, we were looking at chunks that were too big. Uh, and uh, so engineering, I think, is still implementing some of the stuff that we did over a decade ago. And, uh, you know, it's, so we, we learned a lot through the process. And we, we tried to create internal facilitators and what we found out was that our internal facilitators, and there are two of them, maybe three or four of them here in the room today, um, became so accomplished and so uh, in demand that they started getting promoted or recruited away. And uh, so you know, we learned a lot about that as we went along, too. So uh, we, we had early success, and we kept at it. And that's uh, really the critical part, is keeping at it. And you know, the whole concept of lean is... Uh, and the way we look at it is we uh, leap, we learn, figure out where we are, and then leap again. And uh, so that's how we've done our, our lean journey. And so we went from the three-day value streams to what we, our E3 process that Brad's going to talk about. And uh, that has actually been probably our uh, most significant innovation. We've used it to talk to our city commission. City commission, when we're doing something really big, now wants to see the A3. They really don't care much about the PowerPoint, unless the PowerPoint has the A3 in it. And they want to understand that we've analyzed it, that we've looked at countermeasures, and that we, that we know where we're going, and we've got data behind it, and we also know how we're going to evaluate it. So um, it's helped us create a language for explaining change that's been really important for us. When we went through our, uh, our, we call it our transformation phase which, as a city, which started kind of in 2010 or so, we were faced with some very serious financial issues, significant issues that threatened really the way of life here in our city. And using lean is it was one of the things I credit for us uh, getting out of that, working our way out of that, because we, we looked at countermeasures that would help us combat the things that were dragging us down. Uh, we looked at, we used Lean A3 to make critical investments that are going to pay off for decades into the future. And, and without that tool, we wouldn't have been able, would not have been able to do this. We wouldn't be here today. So uh, we've moved from that. We still use A3. 
uh, and use it very well. Uh, we're also using lean techniques to look at now our organization, organizational units. And so in, we did a phase one review of our water and sewer uh, operations, and, and we gave uh, the team the task of saying if we were um, if we were an outside investor like Suez Water or somebody like that, um, what would we do to make our utility attractive for purchase? And what we found is that we could probably do some things, do a little investment, and save about $25 million a year and in our water and sewer utilities. So we've implemented those things and have used <laughs> kind of that, that look-back technique to and lean to figure out how to make our utilities more efficient. So we were already good. Now we're even better. And so now in phase two of that work, we're looking at uh, a larger group, the public services group, and seeing how we can share services back and forth. So instead of having uh, five different silos within the group, we're trying to say, okay, well, how can, we, how can we meld our activities and share resources? And that is a lean way of doing things, and it's helped us out a lot. Um, so we're here because we are um, determined, uh, because we had uh, support from our, uh, from our mayor. Uh, we've now had uh, two mayors and three city managers, all of which support our lean implementation. We have it because we have people within our organization who are willing to learn and adapt and, um, and, um, and embrace uh, lean thinking. And you're going to hear from many of them today. And they are, they are leaders in our organization. They are making us better every day. And uh, the work that they do is critical for, for our success. So I can't tell you how excited I am to, to see this group uh, this large. And I know we've got uh, public people, people from the state, uh, people from private industry here. Uh, share your stories, because that's how we learned. Uh, we learned by understanding what was happening in the private sector and figuring out how to transfer it to local government. And uh, I think that we, in those interactions, uh, we've learned, uh, people learn from us as well. So share your stories, um, share your successes, share your, um, you know, things that didn't go so well. Um, we've had some of those. And, um, but we learn from them as well. So I encourage you to have a, a great uh, day here. Um, really excited about this, and uh, thank you very much for being part of our, our conference. Thank you.